All right, so this week we have Mike Willis here to tell us about um, the S invariant in the manifold S1 cross S2. Take it away, Mike. Hey, thanks, Melissa. Uh, let me start the screen. Is that visible? That looks pretty visible. Uh, do this. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, I'm Mike, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, generalizing Rasmus and Dessin variant and some of the applications that we came up with. So uh, this is all joint work uh, with Chipri and Marco and Chipri, as you see. And yeah, let's let's roll with it. So. Okay, so um, first off, I just want to, you know, without going through the definitions, just review sort of the overall picture of what happens um, in the three sphere. So you have a link in the three sphere. Um, from that link, you can build, well, denote with KC the Kavanov chain complex uh, for a link. And this is a chain complex of bi-graded groups. And, uh, you know, you have a differential that's, you know, a graded differential. If you take homology with respect to that, you get the one-off homology, but you can also add an extra term to this differential, make it uh, filtered instead, this extra term uh, increases the internal grading. And if you use the filter differential and take homology, you get what we call Lee homology instead. And, um, you know, one sort of point of emphasis amongst all this is that, you know, um, this is all sort of just defined purely combinatorially in terms of the link diagram on the plane, right? Like somehow, once you have your link in the three sphere, you project it down to the plane, you kind of forget about any geometry or something of the three sphere and just sort of have planar diagrams, pictures, and combinatorics. Um, but this is sort of just a kind of an overview of what happens. And then, uh, so Lee's theorem says that uh, if you have a link in the three sphere, then the Lee homology uh, over Q, by the way, so uh, everything in the talk will be over the rationals. Um, you can do all this over really any ring with two invertible, but let's stick to the rationals just to keep it simple for a moment. Anyhow, um, the Lee homology over the rationals is a, just you know, a direct sum of copies of Q uh, where you have one sum in for each orientation of the link, right? So somehow the, the link itself didn't really matter. All that mattered was the connected or the, the components, how many components you had. Okay, so that makes it sound really boring and sad, um, but you know, of course, you didn't just have a chain complex, you had this sort of filtered complex, right? So it's the filtration levels that actually carry the interesting information. Uh, so Here's a definition. If you have an oriented link um, in the three sphere, you can define this S invariant, S of L, it's an integer. It's based on, you know, without writing this, this, the definition totally out, it's based on the Q filtration level of the summands, uh, particularly the summands corresponding to the orientation you started with and the opposite orientation. Okay, so uh, from this sort of uh, this information, uh, which is all you know very combinatorial in nature the complex was built combinatorially filtration levels uh, are combinatorially defined um, the idea is or the you know the good news is this data actually uh, tells you something about topology right so the theorem uh, from Rasmussen uh, originally for Knotts and Billy Coben really kind of you know wrote down how you would think about it with links or at least a way to do it um, so Given a weakly connected link cohortism, okay, so let me show that picture. Um, weakly connected just means that your cohortism needs to be entirely, like all the components need to be connected to the first link. So this is sort of a directed idea. A weakly connected link cohortism from one link to another, uh, the Euler characteristic is bounded by the difference in S invariance, right? So, um, this is, you know, uh, the theorem of Rasmussen, and from this, from this, uh, you can 
use the S invariant to give yourself a bound on smooth genus. Uh, so picture, um, you know, the three sphere can be viewed as the boundary of the four ball and your link can be in the three sphere. You could ask what sort of surfaces can it bound in the four ball? Okay, and of course, smooth, smooth surfaces, I mean, right, if you let yourself cone it, that's not very interesting, but for smooth surfaces, you ask what's the minimum genus of such surfaces, and then the corollary to that theorem is that the S invariant uh, gives you a lower bound of such a genus, up to, so uh, absolute value of L here is the number of components of the link. Okay, and I just want to like, you know, emphasize for a moment that um, you know, this is just the corollary, right? The theorem really is this statement about cobordisms between links, right? The, the, the corollary is really, or I should say the theorem is about, you know, having a cobordism between two links means you're, it's the comparison, you know, it's the, having the S invariant of both links is what's important. And so this corollary really comes about from comparing S of your link to S of the unknot. Right, because you know you can sort of puncture the four ball near some little bit of the link, and then see the link, or sorry, of the surface, see the surface of cobordism from the unknot to your link. So this corollary, in some sense, really only works because the S invariant of the unknot is easy to compute. Let's see. Okay. Great. That's what I wanted to say about three sphere. But then you sort of sit down and say, okay, um, this S invariant, you know, uh, you know, it has some similarities with the tau invariant that's uh, from not third homology. Um, similarities, but they're not the same, right? There are specific uh, knots and links where they're known to be different. Um, but, you know, Fleur theory having this more geometric definition, uh, you know, lets you come up with invariance for knots in three manifolds other than the three sphere, right? And, um, and tau, even if you're just thinking about tau coming, you know, for a knot in the three sphere, it still can give some restrictions on surfaces in four manifolds other than the four ball. So of course the three sphere can bound other four manifolds, right? So, um, you know, the, you know, big question, so to speak, and there's lots of progress made on this question, but, you know, the, the, I guess maybe the natural question is, can you define, the, you know, a, a suitable generalization of all these things, Kavanov homology, Lee homology, and S invariant uh, for links in any three manifold, right, at least some other three manifolds, and um, kind of along these lines, but a slightly different question is, you know, the S invariant, even if the S invariant is just for links in S3, um, can it tell you something about surfaces and other four manifolds besides the four ball, right? And then if you combine these questions and you have an S invariant for links and other three manifolds, maybe it can tell you things about surfaces and lots of different four manifolds, right? That's sort of, uh, you know, the overriding hope. And there's lots of people who have uh, done lots of good work on, you know, answering these questions in various ways. Um, for us, uh, what we came up with, um, really following the work of uh, Lev Rosansky, is this picture. So the manifold now, the three manifold will be a connect sum of any finite number of S1 across S2s. I'll denote it MR. Okay, and then we have sort of the same overall picture. But now there is like one caveat here. So the link that you start with, um, it needs to be two divisible in homology. Uh, basically all the handles in S1 cross S2, we need our link to be, uh, you know, passing through these, have evenly many strands passing through these handles. Uh, I'll kind of illustrate a bit in a bit, like why this maybe is necessary. Um, but from such a link, as long as your link is two divisible, um, you can build a Kavanov chain complex 
again, it's by graded and it has a graded differential that gives you what we would call sort of quantology for this link. Uh, but you can also add a term that uh, increases quantum grading or the internal grading. And uh, then if you take homology with respect to this filter differential, uh, you get what we would call a lead homology for the link. And this time around, everything is defined using stable limits of sequences of complexes, Klonov style complexes, uh, for certain links in the three sphere that are related to your link, right? So the idea is somehow your link is sitting in some S1 cross S2s, um, but from your link in S1 cross S2, you're gonna build a new set of links in the three sphere check all the Kalanov complexes for those links and take some kind of limit, a limiting sequence of these. Okay, so I'm gonna describe all that, uh, but I just wanna quickly say like, so in particular, um, it is once again like a combinatorial thing. Uh, once, once it's explained how to build the, the links in S3 from the link in uh, MR, uh, then everything is sort of combinatorial from there. Okay, but I think somebody was about to say something or ask something. Maybe we're okay. Sorry, I thought I heard something. Okay. All right, but yeah, I want to I want to talk about how this definition goes. Somehow, this is uh, a large part of the work involved. Okay, how to build a Kavanov chain complex for a link sitting in a bunch of copies of S1 cross S2. Well, first off, you know we want it to feel like Kavanov homology. So once again, like. Your link is in a bunch of S1 cross S2s. Your first job is to project it down to the plane. You want a planar diagram for this link. And so this is the way we chose to draw it. Um, these spheres here are sort of the, uh, the attaching spheres for the handles of the S1 cross S2. Um, and you know this, these dashed blue lines indicate, you know, yeah, so this, this sphere, there's a handle going from this sphere to that sphere. Um, but, okay, so that's sort of what makes it connect some of S1 cross S2s. And then your link, you know, you just draw a link diagram sort of as normal with some crossings of things, except now the link diagram has endpoints on the spheres because the link can pass through the handle. Okay, and being two divisible in homology means that each sphere, the link has to have even intersection number with each sphere. Okay. Um, so you have a link diagram like this. Um, it maybe should be pointed out while this link diagram is sitting here, you know, um, these dashed blue lines are sort of just a visual indication of which sphere attaches to what. Okay, but we do have to draw them. And, and having drawn them, we have to decide whether the black strands go sort of over or under them. Okay, this is, this is sort of like a crutch or a cat link. There's clearly, an, if I draw this, picture with the black strand going under the dashed blue line. I mean, the dashed blue line isn't really there. So there's clearly an isotopy in S1 cross S2 that lets the black strand pass through the dashed blue strand. Okay, so you might say, why draw it at all? But, you know, because drawing it sort of involves some kind of choice, right? But yes, we do need to draw it because to build the links in S3, to build the links in S3, we essentially each one of these dashed lines, which are in blue, I replace with sort of a cable, uh, you know, an n-fold cable where n is the intersection number of the link with that attaching sphere. So I essentially just draw, you know, in this case, two parallel strands connecting the endpoints of the link, sort of in place of what the dashed blue line was saying to do. Okay, and in particular, when I do this over here, if, if the dashed blue line was sort of passing over the black strand, I draw my cable passing over the black strand. Okay, and then furthermore, after you know drawing these cablings, uh, I also insert. So this symbol indicates K1 full twists. I insert some number of full twists into this cable and some number of full twists to this cable. Okay, and the number of full twists here and the number of full twists here is precisely this parameter of k, this like vector parameter k, 
is a parameter saying how many food twists to put in each table. Okay, uh, positive food twists. And um, and then, so yeah, oh, sorry. Once you do this, you just forget that the handles existed. You forget about the attaching spheres, you forget about the handles, and you just look at this diagram and you say, hey, I have a diagram for a link in S3. And I know how to take on off complexes of links in S3. So I take a complex, I take the complex of this guy in S3, okay, and then I have to take some kind of limit as the twisting goes to infinity. Okay, and this limiting procedure, as each amount of twisting grows infinite, is the definition, our definition for the Kavanov complex for this, for this link diagram, I guess I should say. Okay, um, great. Uh, so I want to explain how like the limiting procedure works, um, but before I do that, let me just like re-emphasize you know, the link is in S1 cross, or in MR, like these connect sums of S1 cross S2. So there are isotopies over here that involve the black strand passing through the dashed blue strand. So whatever this definition is, this limit is, it has to somehow allow for isotopies like here in S3 that like allow the black strand to somehow pass through the blue cables, if this really is gonna be some kind of link invariant. Right, and of course there are other isotopies in S1 cross S2 that are not sort of so immediately clear in S3. Like in S1 cross S2, I could take a strand and sort of pass it through the handle, and the result over here would be adding more blue strands and twisting them all together. So I don't want to draw all these things, uh, but the the sort of most I think key part of this is the this issue that you need the black strands to be able to pass through the blue ones in the three sphere, if you want this to really be a link invariant. Okay, so I want to describe a little bit about how that goes, but maybe this is a good place to pause and see if uh, anybody has any questions on sort of the overall picture. Mike, okay. can I ask a quick question? Yeah, what's up? Nico Kuchlow here. I was wondering this limit you're taking, these uh, k's going to infinity. Yeah. Is it all related to uh, Kirby moves checking Dane filling for three manifolds? Or is that what makes this thing? Like what really makes this work, right? <laughs> no, um, not what this makes this work is what about this makes the picture work for you. What, what does this limit facilitate? So, so yes, I, I want to illustrate that uh, very quickly here. Um, so actually, yeah, let me let me illustrate the limiting process and what it is that's that it's accomplishing to help the picture work. But afterward, maybe I'll have to see if, if you know I've answered your question or not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. What what are the infinite twists actually accomplishing here? Okay. Um, so here's the theorem. Um, about these infinite twists. And this theorem is due to Rosansky, um, you know, who first was sort of doing this uh, for just a single S1 cross S2. And Rosansky realized that if you take complexes for full twists, um, sort of in this Barnaton category of pictures and cobordisms, okay, these full twist complexes, as long as, so N is the number of strands, K is the number of twists. Uh, as long as n is even, these full twist complexes, again, you have to truncate them, but let me skip that. Uh, for even n, uh, they stabilize as k grows into some limiting complex. Okay, the limiting complex is supported in non-positive homological grading. Okay, so it is an infinite complex. You're sort of building a complex from infinite twists. So you get an infinite complex, but only in one direction, what's bounded above. Uh, and most importantly, the complex consists entirely of split diagrams. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, it's easiest to illustrate when there's only two strands. Uh, clearest in the case n equals two. Okay, so this first line, 
if you take the complex for one full twist on two strands and you perform a little bit of like Gaussian elimination or something, you can simplify it to, again, this is all sort of happening in Barnett-Tong's category, um, to this, you know, uh, complex of pictures. Okay, the underlying term, by the way, is homological degree zero. Okay, uh, these Q symbols, these are Q grading shifts. Um, it's, it's not so important for us. I, I maybe shouldn't have even put them in here, but uh, th there are like degree shifts going on while you're doing this. But um, in particular, you get like some kind of um, complex for, for one full twist. Okay, whereas if you do the complex for two full twists, it of course looks a little bit longer. Okay, but the key point is that the complex for one full twist, if you truncate it to like just these last two terms, that truncated complex is actually like equal on the nodes to this truncated complex for, um, you know, after having simplified the complex for two full twists, these, the, the truncation match. Okay. Uh, and then if you had done three full twists, what you see is that compared to two full twists, the two full, two, the two full twist complex, if you truncate it down to this part, um, this piece matches the truncated, the truncated complex for the three full twists. You can sort of go on forever. And all that ever happens is that you keep pushing this other term, this like vertical resolution, the zero resolution, um, out further and further to the left. And thus there is a, you know, a uh, rigorous way to say you're taking some kind of stable limit of truncated complexes and building this uh, limiting complex that is built entirely out of these what I would call split diagrams. So split here means any strand that starts on the bottom also ends on the bottom. Or to put another way, there's a gap in the picture. Okay, and this gap is what's very important. You see, the gap is essentially um, the, the gap is what lets this blue, sh the black strand pass through the blue strand. So you have to imagine, um, let me go back to, to this picture. You have to imagine that, okay, here's your, your link, but then you're going to take some kind of limit as the twisting goes to infinity and, and think about the limiting complex. And if it's true that the limiting complex is built entirely with pictures where like all the pictures in here are split, and have this gap available, then the black strand has the ability to pass through that gap. Or to put it another way, if your complex has these gaps in it, you've effectively, like, you've successfully ignored the handle in S1 cross S2. Okay, so this is the sense in which, or well, one sense in which infinite full twisting is helpful, is that it creates these gaps in the complexes that allow the black strand to pass through. You might say, why don't I use like some other complex just made of all gaps? Like I can think of any number of complexes filled with gaps like this. Okay, but the full twist is also important for other reasons. For one, it's central in the braid group. And it's certainly true that like if I have a braid down here, I should be able to pass the entire braid through the handle and get it up here. So once again, like full twists are a good thing that allows braids to essentially pass through what used to be passing through the handle. Now I've successfully ignored the handle, but I still want to say I can pass through the full twists. Um, and similarly, there are other isotopies, not just passing a braid through, but passing like a turn back through. Uh, you can also uh, sort of wind that around the full twist. Anyway, there's, so, um, like I think this, the, the simplest point of view is to say, yeah, these infinite full twists are allowing on the one hand, the black strand to be able to pass through, and on the other hand, like uh, the black strand to be able to pass through blue strands, and you know, various tangles to pass through the handle because you can pass anything through a full twist. Okay, so let me pause and ask uh, you if I've actually answered this question. Maybe it's not clear. Yes, I, I, 
in some sense you have, I have to translate it into, into the way I like to see this, but, but thank you. This, that was very helpful. Okay. Awesome. You're Thanks. somehow inverting the full twist, right? What you're doing is you're inverting the full twist by taking a direct limit over full twists. Am I, can I see it that way? Am I inverting the full twist? Uh, a direct limit over all full twists in some sense. So I, I'd like to see that as something being inverted and what you're, what's being inverted is the full twist. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's, hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I would say it this way, but yes, it is absolutely true that, you know, somehow, uh, you know, so the version of this that, that I've seen, you know, and thought about is that somehow, you know, you get S1 cross S2 as some sort of, you know, zero surgery. And zero is some kind of limit of one over N, in, in, or one over K, say, and this K is sort of, you know, each one over K is twisting, right? And so you're sort of, uh, um, you're trying to invert zero in some sense, but, uh, or not invert zero, sorry, you're inverting infinity to uh, reach zero, but I'm not sure if that's related to how you're sort of thinking about it, but. Um, uh, I'm can, not can, sure I, can I add something? Yeah, sure, what's up? Um, well, the full twist is already invertible, so this process doesn't make it invertible. But what, what you're doing is you're, I mean, I, you're projecting onto a particular one dimension, you're project, projecting onto a particular eigenspace of the full twist. Um, so the full twist acts on split diagrams by a constant, by a fixed constant, regardless of what the split diagram is. And so by, by doing this limit, you're, anyway, I don't know if that helps at, at all. But this limit is a particular item potent, which projects onto the sort of zero eigenspace or like one eigenspace of the full twist. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So just to expand on that a little bit, like, uh, you know, um, yeah, this is absolutely a very specific item potent. Um, and in a similar sense, this is a very specific limiting procedure. There are other ways to limit the full twist. Um, there are limit these infinite twists, sorry. Um, but, you know, we sort of need this very specific one because, again, we need these split diagrams because we want the black strand to be able to pass through the blue strands. Um, okay, but let me maybe uh, just sort of summarize that, right? So split diagrams in general um, are what allow these black strands to pass through the blue ones. I mean, there's still a lot to check there. Somehow they need to all pass through coherently, um, but that's part of the game. Um, you also have this, this issue, okay, so I say, um, you know, stable limit. Uh, stability here basically means that if you choose some finite homological degree that you're interested in, then I can choose some finite amount of twisting so that the truncated complex that we're actually after, this is like the, the true complex for the link in S1 cross S2s. Okay, if I truncate it, that complex, you know, is something like literally equal to, well, okay, so th this is just the statement of what it means. Uh, you can think of this, the complex you want as some kind of complex of, you know, the link with the infinite twists in it. But again, you want to truncate it. And after truncation, then it's, equivalent to the complex for uh, the, uh, so L of, you know, the finite twisting. So, and again, but after the truncation. So the whole idea is some sort of, you know, the whole idea is if you're interested in what we're calling von homology for links in MR, in any specific range, okay, you can compute this by computing traditional Kamana homology um, for what we would call a finite approximation link in the three sphere. Okay, uh, so in this sense, computing these things is equivalent to computing homology for complicated links in the three sphere. Okay, and, and yeah, and so this is, you know, as always in theory, a finite computation that 
well, it is a finite computation that in theory you could perform. <laughs> okay. Um, and, you know, all this uh, works just as well um, with the filter differential and with Lie homology as well. So, this lets you sort of define, uh, I mean, all, all of this was defining the complex, right? And then from the complex, you decide which differential you want. Um, and so if you use the Lie differential, you can define Lie homology and an S variant, maybe. Okay. Um, so if you think about it, um, you know, if you have this link in these S1 cross S2s and you want to uh, think about its Lie homology, and if you believe in this stable limiting process, then you believe that the Lie homology really is just the Lie homology of some finite approximation link in the three sphere. But you already know the Lie homology for links in the three sphere is easy. It's just, you know, based on orientations of that link, L of K. Okay, this link with maybe lots of twisting in it, but that doesn't really affect the number of connected components. So the question really becomes, um, in these finite approximations, which orientations of the finite approximation links give rise to Lie homology in the finite approximation that actually survives the limiting procedure, right? Like um, that actually sort of is already stable and isn't just going to disappear as you take the limit. Um, and the answer um, is, so yeah, you have a link in a bunch of S1 cross S2s and the Lie homology over the rationals uh, is again, direct sum of Qs, but you get one sum and for each orientation of the link that would make the link null homologous in MR, in the S1 cross S2s. Okay, so this is maybe a reasonable generalization of the three sphere version, given that you know all links are null homologous in the three sphere, or sorry, all, well, yeah, all oriented links any orientation of the link makes it not homologous. But in the S1 cross S2, you really uh, need this condition. Um, and the idea of the proof is basically that you show that the null homologous oriented resolutions kind of stabilize right away, whereas all the other ones get pushed out to the left, never stabilize. And actually, once you think about it for a moment, um, this is not so surprising, uh, as in the case for two strands. Like, so here's, again, the simplified complex for one full twist. And you can work out, okay, so like the oriented resolution like lives in the unsimplified complex. But when you simplify it, the oriented resolution, if the strands were in opposite directions, the oriented resolution lives here. Okay, um, and thus it's sort of, in the slot that's already the same for two full twists, it's already the same for three full twists, and it's in a slot that survives the limiting procedure. Okay, uh, so that corresponds to, you know, the two strands being oppositely oriented through the handle, it means you were null homologous, uh, at least, you know, through that handle. Um, you would need that through every handle. Meanwhile, if the two strands had been in the same direction, then, of course, well, not of course, but you know, the oriented resolution lives here for, for one full twist. But then the oriented resolution for two, two full twists lives here. And in the limit, the oriented resolution for such an orientation of the link gets pushed out to negative infinity and sort of disappears. Okay, and the reason I want to say like this, this is a somewhat natural thing to maybe see happening is you already have Rosansky proving that in the limit, the only diagrams that to survive are split, right? So, and of course, a split diagram has to be sort of, you know, can't have any orientations getting from one end to the other. So in some sense, the fact that only the, the null homologous guys have a chance of surviving is, you know, uh, immediate from Rosansky's results. And then it's just a check that they all do survive. Okay. Um, great. So um, this basically means that you can treat Lie homology for these links in S1 cross S2 the same way you could in S3 
you still have sort of a notion of like, you know, how one of these summands corresponds to an orientation of the link. And there's some notion of like, it corresponds to an oriented resolution of the link where, you know, the oriented resolution of the infinite twist lives kind of in this far right end. Okay. And uh, so with all of that in mind, uh, we can try to make the same definition. You're handed a null homologous oriented link in some S1 cross S2s. You can define an S invariant based on the Q filtration level of the two summands here that correspond to your orientation for your link and the opposite orientation. Okay, so um, yeah, once you believe that this whole statement sort of passes through and the oriented resolution idea that passes through, you're sort of led to the exact same definition. Um, the fact that it's well defined, I, I maybe don't want to spend so much time here. Um, I mean, you want to show this is well defined for links, right? Uh, and this S1 cross S2s, and the idea is still um, uses the same ideas that Rasmus and Nagali Bilderberg did. Uh, you ought to check that isotopies of the links in the S1 cross S2s induce you know, equivalences that actually preserve these oriented resolutions, that actually send one oriented resolution to another. Um, I, I, I wanted to at least bring it up because this is one place where um, there's sort of an unnaturality about what we're doing. Um, the equivalences actually use the finite approximations. But, you know, when you build a finite approximation, you have a choice of finite k to use. And different choices of k may actually lead to slightly different equivalence maps here that have slightly, I mean, they still preserve these oriented resolutions, but only up to a scalar multiple. And the scalar multiple may change depending on k. Uh, so there is this sort of vague unnaturality, potentially. We, we don't know. I mean, we, we haven't actually uh, got examples where it matters, but we weren't able to prove that uh, this equivalence is independent of your finite approximation. But in any case, uh, so basic properties, just to kind of say right off the bat, um, you know, since everything is defined in terms of these stabilizing limits, you can compute S invariants with finite approximation. Um, so the S invariant of your link in the S1 cross S2s is equal to the S invariant of the link in the three sphere. Uh, the amount of twisting you need, uh, we can sort of give you the direct bound. Um, it's based on the number of positive crossings in the original link, like the link with no twisting added. Um, and so again, you know, it's, it's all sort of finitely computable, although in practice, you might have to add a lot of twists to your diagram. Um, but because everything is computable in terms of links in S3, you sort of inherit just a bunch of properties of the S invariant from uh, for links in S3, here's one that's just sort of easy to state quickly. Um, if you have a bunch of links and a bunch of different uh, S1 and cross S2s, then you can, you know, take their disjoint union in the connect sum of all your different S1 and cross S2s, um, and the S invariant is additive in the proper uh, sets. Uh, you subtract one for each. each uh, original uh, set of S1 cross S2s. But this is just a, uh, a quick thing that comes right from similar properties in S3. Okay, but of course the important thing, you know, all this is all well and good, but it's, you know, the important thing is that it still gives you information about topology. So yeah, the theorem is you have the same sort of statement if you have one of these weakly connected Link cohortisms, uh, and now in MR cross I, okay, um, from one, uh, well, it should say null homologous, I guess, here, null homologous link to another. Um, then the difference in S invariance gives you a bound on the Euler characteristic of your surface, right? So, uh, yeah, this was sort of you know, the main hope that this would work, and it did. Uh, the proof essentially goes the same way, except again, uh, 
your surface now can involve isotopies in S1 process two, and so you got to check all of these. Okay, um, so because of that theorem, you can get corollaries again uh, about genus bounds. But this time around, there's sort of two, um, I mean, so like the three sphere, the some quote unquote natural way to fill it maybe is the four ball. But for S1 process twos, there's sort of maybe two natural choices. So on the one hand, you could say, I have my link in a bunch of S1 process twos, and I want to view my S1 process two, I mean, S1 bounds D2, right? So one way to, one four manifold to fill this width would be boundary connect sums of D2 cross S2s, and then look at surfaces in there. Or you could say, well, S2 bounds D3, so I'd rather think of my three manifold as bounding a big boundary connect sum of S1 cross D3s, okay? And then talk about surfaces, again, smooth in here. And uh, these two, so, the corollary, um, how does the S invariant help you here? Well, again, this all still only works for null homologous guys, but if you have a null homologous link uh, in your S1 process twos, then the S invariant provides a lower bound for genus um, in the D2 cross S twos. Okay, this, this symbol really does mean the, in the boundary connects up these guys, okay? Um, meanwhile, negative S of the mirror of your link, okay, uh, provides the bound for, or provides a, a lower bound for genus in these S1 cross D3s. And you actually have sort of this square of inequalities, uh, which is very similar to the square that um, was pretty recently shown by Ed and Reyes to uh, work for Tau. Okay, so again, S sort of, has the similarity with tau, although, yeah, we do have some examples where they're different. Um, okay, and this box of inequalities, I just want to mention, because I, I mentioned, like, in on the three sphere and using the four ball, the important thing was not just S of your link, it was being able to compare to S of the unknot, which was easy to compute. Here, the unknot is not good enough. Okay, if you if you're when you're after the D2 cross S2 bound, um, the key is that you need to be able to compare. You, you can see your surface as a cobordism from the link you're interested in to this very specific link. Like it sort of plays the role of the unknot when you have a handle involved. Okay, um, we call this FPP F for fiber, P for uh, well. P strands going up and P strands going down. It has to be null homologous. So this is for P equals two. Okay, and so instead of S of the unknot, you need to be able to compute S of this guy. Okay, which is essentially saying you need to be able to compute S of sort of the infinite torus link, right? Because if you close, if you, um, well, that's what you would build uh, in S3 is a bunch of just torus links, okay? But in fact, we don't compute this with porous links. We compute this to be 2p minus 1 by reinterpreting the whole thing uh, as Hawk shield homology of an identity tangle in I cross S2. So again, I, I don't have a lot of time, so let me not say too much here. But Rosansky's sort of original version of how to do all this uh, was based on taking Hawk shield homology you know, for the tangle homology for a guy in the interval cross S2 that Hawk shield homology should sort of identify the end. And uh, and so same sort of uh, you know the infinite twists then were sort of uh, the projective resolution we're we're providing sort of the projective resolution uh, but instead of using the infinite twist projective resolution we use sort of like a, a bar like resolution and uh, are able to make this computation okay. Um, so this computation comes up when you want to prove this inequality, right? But this computation, okay, so, okay, so, so uh, th this was all stuff about links in S1 cross S2s. 
I want to like step backward for a moment um, and go back to links in S3 and say, here's a very specific link in S3, a, a single full twist. So like, you know, the one full twist torus link oriented, you know, with P strands going up and P strands going down. This link in, in the three sphere is what we would call sort of that FPP one, like we put one full twist into FPP. Okay, and because of, because this is such a simple uh, link in S1 cross S2s, you know, the stable limit, the limit actually stabilizes right away. And you can work out that the S invariant for this link viewed in three sphere needs to be equal to the S invariant for the, uh, the FPP back in S1 cross S2s. And the S1 cross S2 one, you can compute using Hawk shield homology. So in fact, this is a method to get the S invariant for this torus link uh, sort of through um, Hawk shield homology. So then you ask, what good does that do you? Okay, I've got the S invariant for a very specific link that maybe I didn't have before. Well, this leads to uh, an adjunction inequality um, where I want to think about surfaces not in the four ball, but in connect sums of CP2 bars. Okay, so now my four manifold, again, I'm thinking about my link in the three sphere. So I say, okay, uh, my four manifold is going to be a punctured collection of CP2 bars. Okay, so its boundary is a three sphere. Okay, and I think about the link in that boundary three sphere, and I think about surfaces bounded by it. Okay, and now I do need this extra assumption that my guys are null homologous. Okay, um, but the theorem is if under these assumptions, uh, the S invariant again provides a bound on uh, the topology, you know, or on the uh, or their characteristic of such surfaces. Okay, there's a similar bound for tau. Uh, the bound for tau is uh, more involved, or you know, handles homologically essential surfaces. Okay, which we don't currently have uh, the tools to handle. But um, in the case, and for null homologous surfaces, the bounds look uh, very, very similar. And the proof, you know, without saying too much, the, the, the main issue here is that if you're going to think of your three sphere as bounding a bunch of, you know, a punctured CP2s, CP2 bars, then the key is that you have to compare the S invariant of your link, not with the S invariant of the unknot, okay, but in fact with the S invariant of that very specific uh, torus link, the single full twist torus link, okay. Um, and this comes from, uh, I mean, why this torus link, you have to sit down and like look at the handle decomposition of CP2 bar with a single two handle and see how your surface uh, is sort of transversely intersecting that two handle. Okay. Um, great. So corollary, and either the last thing I want to you know, talk a little bit about uh, I have like a minute. Um, what this ends up meaning is that the S invariant cannot be used to detect exotic smooth structures on block twists of the four sphere, four sphere, uh, as was sort of you know one of the main hopes in this uh, paper by Friedman, Donk, Morrison, and Walker. So you know, uh, if you're not familiar, the basic idea is: wouldn't it be great if I could think of a link? In my three sphere, that uh, I knew for some reason to be sliced in a Gluck twist, right? Um, um, the four ball, but I could also obstruct from being sliced in the standard four ball, right? Then my Gluck twist would be homeomorphic to my four ball to the standard four ball, but must not be diffeomorphic to it because I've changed the, uh, you know, the existence of certain smooth surfaces. And, um, and so the, the idea was, you know, so a lot of, you know, the gauge theoretic invariants sort of couldn't really uh, distinguish this because they're sort of 
you have this geometric definition, you sort of are keeping track of a lot. But the hope was the S is variant. It has this sort of combinatorial definition. Maybe it'll kind of see through this, uh, but unfortunately it doesn't work. And the essential idea is that um, if your guy is a buck twist of the four sphere, then after it connects something with the CP2 bar, you're basically a CP2 bar. Um, and at that stage, this injunction inequality for S, this guy, which again, is similar to what happened to Tau, this injunction inequality prevents you from like having different bounds for links um, viewed in the boundary of CP2 bar versus the four ball. So essentially whatever bounds you would get in one uh, would be equivalent to the bounds you would get for the other. So yeah, the S invariant cannot tell these things apart. Okay, uh, I'm out of time. Um, so maybe I'll not say so much about Slice or Benikin and end here. Thanks, guys. <laughs> okay, thanks, Mike. All right, a uh, lot of clapping. Are there any questions for Mike? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Hey, what's up? Hey. Um, so right now, the invariant for links that we have, uh, yeah, so the invariant of links, like the analog of Ivanova Malji, for links requires that they be null homologous. Yeah. Is, that right? is there any, um, like, do you expect there to be a way of defining, defining such an invariant for non null homologous links? Um, if so, uh, I think it would need sort of a genuinely uh, different idea. Um, Yeah, the simple answer is it doesn't look good using this idea. So yeah, for uh, you know, links in these S1 cross S2s, um, you know, the, the, our definition of the S invariant was geared towards, we wanted it to be based on oriented resolutions because those were the things that we could check for being preserved by cohortisms because you know, in the end, the invariant is sort of only as good as what it tells you about cohortisms, right? Um, but yeah, these oriented resolutions do not survive the limiting procedure. Uh, they cannot possibly allow black strands to pass through them, at least not in sort of a visually natural way. Um, so uh, any such, you know, anything like like an S variant uh, for these things, I think would need some kind of genuinely uh, new idea that's not so related to how we think of um, Rasmussen's proofs in the three sphere. Uh, all that said, um, you know, there's no problem with defining the complex in the homology for, like, the one of homology for such links. Um, but this also kind of maybe plays at the issue. Uh, if you define the one of homology for an oriented link in S1 cross S2s, where it is homologically essential, then the homology is only def well defined up to grading shifts. Uh, you can perform isotopies that actually shift grading. Uh, this is, I think, is related to this issue that you know um, the scheme module for S1 cross S2 has torsion, right? Like, like, so some powers of Q are equal to some other powers of Q somehow, um, you know, in a very hand wavy sense down in the scheme module for certain links, you know. Uh, so the Kamanov homology also seems to be only well defined up to certain shifts in the Q grading, and that seems to be unfortunate if you want, you know, to have some kind of well defined filtration level whose absolute differences are actually going to tell you something about um, about the technology. So yeah, uh, it, it looks bad. Yeah. From what we've. Seen. Mm. Uh, actually, let me say one other thing about that, though. Um, if you forget about the S1 cross S2s for a moment, instead ask just about the adjunction inequality um, in the CP2 bars, right? That was something specific about the S invariant of an oriented full twist in the three sphere, 
Okay, we computed it using S1 process two, but um, if you just ask this question about uh, the junction inequalities in CP2 bars, um, the, the junction equality would basically be, you know, um, compare S invariant, the S invariant of your link to the S invariant of a full twist oriented, you know, homologically according to, well, you know, according to however your surface needed. So if your surface was homologically essential in the CP2 bars, um, I mean, it basically comes down to computing the S invariant for torus links where the orientations on the strands are, um, you know, are you're free to choose. And so, you know, we have some conjectures about what the formula ought to be for this, but uh, no proof. <laughs> Just experimenting, uh, like conjectures and experimenting with, you know, minimal, very small tourists. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions for Mike? So you can use this intentional twist to define uh, colored homology for links in S3, I guess, in some way, right? Because you take a cable and you start adding the intent full twist, something like this. Yeah, yeah, okay, so um I so Matt's actually probably the better person to answer this for but okay, so here's the thing. Like if you just want uh colored homology um for a link in S3, you cable the link according to the framing and you insert infinite full twists, but um the issue is for the colored homology, these colored SL2 homologies, you're trying to project onto a different uh, weight space than what this uh, infinite twist is doing. So for colored homology, you're taking a different infinite twist limit that is not entirely split diagrams. Um, mm, I think this is a choice of your color. Like, I mean, you can choose either one. Uh, so I, but I don't know. What the, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the correct coloring would be like. This this is the zero colored invariant. The zero colored, okay. So every knot gets associated the same, the same homology up to a shift. Mm -hmm. Because you can pass strands through the projector. And un That's and right, you yes, can, you can unlock it. I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. But I guess my question is, so does it teach us anything about the uh, links in S3? Like if you have a cable and you start adding full twist, like, what happens to S invariant, for example? Yeah. Uh, yes, it does. So uh, I lose track of this very easily. But yes, you can say things like, okay, if I have a, um, mm -hmm. so if I have a link and I insert, okay, if I have a, a link diagram and I see somewhere in there uh, some even number of strands with like opposite orientation. So like two strands oriented up and two strands oriented down. Okay, and I cut there and insert sort of, you know, this uh, a full twist there. The S invariant can only go up or down. And I can't remember which one it is now. Um, maybe I can find it quickly, but let's see. So the S invariant after adding one of these full twists, um, can only go down. That's right. The yes, American can only go down. Um, but this is only for the case when the full twist involved, you know, right, strands with uh, sort of canceling orientations, uh, because that's what our uh, our procedures here were using. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. All right, for the sake of the recording, I'm gonna stop here and thank Mike again. Let's thank him again. Hey, thanks guys. Um, so if you have to go, um, you can feel free to go now, but I guess I'm going to hand host Hood to Mike so that he can answer questions for as long as he is willing to. 
Um, yeah, so keep the conversation going if you would like to. Yeah, sure. I've got a little bit of time here. How's everybody doing? I take it for anything. 